Welcome to the Hit Like a Girl podcast. This is High Tea with Grace, where we spill the tea on HIT. I'm excited to welcome Elena Yakovleva, healthcare industry consultant and analyst at Chillmark. Thanks for joining us, Elena. Oh, hi, Grace. Thank you so much for having me on. So tell us about the path that brought you to Chillmark. Oh, wow. It was uh, quite a long road until I landed at Chillmark. I have more than 11 years of experience in revenue cycle management, and that's pretty much it has been my bread and butter over, well, over a decade. And at some point, I just realized that I would really like to make an impact Mm -hmm. uh, in the industry. And unfortunately, back in the days, I couldn't see many opportunities to do that um, in my particular role and uh, revenue cycle management, you know, it does not allow you much space to be creative and to rethink the processes and to make uh, some global improvements. And I started to look for other opportunities and it took me a year and a half actually uh, before I found my perfect company and it was Chillmark Research. And uh, I had an interview with John Moore the third first and I fell under his spell right away and then I talked to John Moore the second who is the founder of Chillmark and I just realized that it's definitely my happy spot and I started to work with them in 2002 in uh, February and has been happy ever since so that's pretty much my journey and also I'm coming from sociology background and research has always sparked my interest. So as a leading industry anal analyst, Chalmark Research is really, really well respected. You're really respected. You know, what trends excite you the most about health in healthcare right now? You know, what trends are, you know, getting you excited about how things are changing in the space? Mm -hmm. Wonderful question, Grace. Thank you so much for this one. Um, you know, I will probably name three just because I'm always trying to stick to the structure of three. <laughs> uh, one that excites me the most is No Surprises Act. I feel like it actually made a lot of folks moving very quickly in this area. And again, it also, it has a certain um, lens that I carry from the RCM because obviously I've been seeing, you know, a lot of situations when patients were paying amounts that they were not supposed to paying or providers were not reimbursed in the way they were supposed to and so on and so on and why self-pay was so much higher than contracted amounts and so um, so from provider directories to actually, you know, paying for your medical services I think it created this transformative experience for patients. And I always try to put myself um, in the shoes of the patient first. That's my approach in all my research. And I think it's truly transform transformative that you can find a provider that you really want based on concerns you have um, and just to have the smooth overall experience from uh, the, from requesting medical care to actually paying for it. I think it's one of the biggest ones. Um, also, I would like to touch consumer patient trends that we all see. We're all talking about the retail stepping into healthcare and mm -hmm. bringing a lot of expertise in consumer experience. And I think it set expectations much higher now. So all the traditional folks, provider um companies and individual providers, what have you, they're all trying to make sure that they have all the tools. They're trying to uh, run up, you know, to the best practices on the market. So that's for sure. It's uh, very positive, again, for patients. And also, I, I feel like uh, this competition that it creates, um, definitely it's not easy. And I hear a lot of complaints <laughs> uh, <laughs> from a lot of folks that saying that they just cannot keep up with this. It's so costly. The process is so tough. But in the end, I am positive we're going to see some super cool changes. So the competition, you know, it just makes all of us better and draw a new horizon. And the third uh, trend is probably decentralized care. And that's mm. my precise area of interest and research for the past six months. Um, 
I'm coming from a medical family, and my mom was doing something like that in 1990s. Wow. And it was so labor intensive, and it was such a huge way to live back then when we did not have technology. So, I mean, we all can probably remember <laughs> um, what technology looked like, you know, 30 years ago, but it was definitely not a plentiful space. Uh, and right now, I do see that actually the demand um, of those kind of services, right, like uh, specialized uh, remote patient monitoring programs, hospital at home, and so on and so on, uh, patients actually learn more and more about this, and they're learning the benefits of it, of this. And actually, industry right now just tells them, like, guys, you can finally do that. Do you want to stay in your own bed? You can do that. <laughs> And I think Very it's true. It's fantastic. so exciting to see the progress happening um, in that space, in all three of those spaces. What innovation trends do you think are going to fade away? <laughs> we talked about uh, ones you like and which ones do you think are going to just, <laughs> hot or not, which trends are not going to stay? This is an amazing question. And also it's a very tricky one. Uh, you know, always when you're trying to look into your crystal ball, and predict the future, you have um, this very low percentage of certainty, but I'll try to do my best. I think that some larger trends in RCM, like peer provider platforms that are de developing heavily right now, and again, my I am just filled with joy when I see progress in those areas. Um, I think that they just squeeze out from the market those niche tiny, maybe even large providers that were covering, that were patching the system over the last 50 years. You know, they are trying, they were trying to make sure that this particular provider sends certain stuff uh, to the payer uh, and just securing just one tiny little thing that enable billing processes or like processes of authorizing uh, certain medical services. So I do think that those guys either will have to rethink and expand their functionality greatly, or unfortunately, they're just going to be slowly fading away over the next five to 10 years. I couldn't agree more with that. And as you know, a patient advocate, I just hope that space innovates fast. <laughs> so I'm wondering, in addition to No Surprises Act, what healthcare policies are you tracking right now that you believe will have the most impact on digital health? Mm -hmm. Well, another fantastic question. And uh, just, I'll be honest with you, my main focus is on uh, policies that are supporting decentralized care. Uh, and yeah, so pretty much I my, my main goal is to see a certain level of support that those policies will be able to secure for those remote programs. I think it's going to be quite transformative because it's, I mean, we all know it's proven by multiple studies that it does save money if done in a, in a right way. And also it enables patients to stay with their families. So mm -hmm. I see a definite benefit to all of patients in the United States. And I just hope that it's going to move quicker than it has been in the last 10, 15 years. And there are some very high hopes because I see that they are just, you know, kicking kick, kick those policies with a quite a good rate. I would love for you to tell me a bit about the recent Chelmark Hospital at Home MTR report. What are the greatest opportunities that you're seeing in this space? A well, hospital at home is my baby uh, that recently was posted uh, by Chilmark Research. And in this report, I am pretty much outlining what challenges we have with hospital at home, what kind of programs we have within hospital at home, since it's well beyond uh, the CMS description of acute hospital at home program. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm just tackling, you know, potential markets. I uh, divide market by a number of categories. I am outlining vendors who can actually make it happen. Um, and also talk a little bit about the overall progress in this space, how it's going to go uh, within the next five years, what results should we expect, and what should we do to make sure we are ready 
because it is happening. It's inevitable. <laughs> Patients want it. Providers want it. So I'm just trying to kind of lead providers and vendors into this space, especially those ones who are just jumping into this market and also uh, trying to make sure those big guys who has been who have been in this space for quite some time, they know who they're dealing with. So that's my ultimate goal of this report. Mm. What have you found to be the greatest challenges facing hospital at home? Um, you know, just like any policy, it, it's never developing uh, equally. Uh, so let's say if you look uh, in Texas, uh, hospital at home has huge popularity in there, but at the same time, they're facing challenges like uh, patients that just live in a very rural areas and they don't have connection. So if they don't have stable connection, we can forget about telehealth visits, we can forget about RPM tools and so on. So that's probably challenge number one. Challenge number two is that uh, just like many other programs, sizing up has always been an issue. When you're pouring a lot of resources into those first two or five patients and process seem to, to work smoothly and then you add another 100 patients and something goes wrong. Um, it's a very old problem and I'm also tackling why does it happen and how to avoid those uh, critical mistakes uh, in launching your hospital at home at full stage. Um, also, I would probably say that the reimbursement policy in general in hospital at home is still a mystery for some providers. And also I'm touching that in my report. Um, Typically, we talk about value-based care and how to understand payments for value-based care, right? And it has been a very hot subject for years. Um, those probably three biggest issues with hospital at home and that I see as like main challenges. Mm -hmm. What do you think the vendors that are launching the most successful programs quickly are doing right? What are the things... the in their recipe that are making what they're doing successful? I think the, the main point is those vendors have to see their product with eyes of providers. Mm -hmm. I think it's crucial because the main leaf, um, so like pretty much the main work that's going to be done is by medical providers. And they need to make sure it's super friendly. It's easy. It's optimized to the working processes that are already exist within the hospital provider organization. Uh, and also, I think uh, the moment that a lot of vendors, they just forget is teaching module. So it's like very robust and comprehensive tutorials that will enable providers to make the best out of the technology they're purchasing or using. Do you think that change management is a huge hurdle for adoption of hospital at home and the success of hospital at home uh, programs? For sure. Yeah, without a doubt. But again, it depends on how much experience a provider organization previously had, right? And how it's... A able to apply existing knowledge and professionals that work in every single organization to adopt it, to actually make sure that they have a successful hospital at home program. So after talking with all these great companies in the hospital at home space, you know, developing this report, you know, really seeing the potential in decentralized care, what do you see this looking like in 10, 20 years? Like, what do you hope to happen in this space that would really revolutionize or transform the way care is delivered and received? You know, probably the picture that excites me the most is seeing a full hospice care at home. Mm -hmm. I am convinced that uh, within the home infrastructure to see newborns in home is as natural as seeing our older relatives passing away in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, it's not only a humane way of ending your life, but it's also very, uh, how would I say, it, 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 it's, it's a crucial experience for the younger generations just to see how their older ones passing 
away in respect and care surrounded by their loved ones. That is one. Another um, probably is uh, postpartum care. And again, so when you have all the stress and difficulties that you face through the whole process of delivery and so on, um, I, I think it just creates those precious life moments to be home with your newborn early and home with your husband or your wife, um, surrounded by relatives or friends, uh, your supporting circle. I also think that hospital at home is well um, capable of providing this service as well. And I, I just honestly, I just cannot wait to see that happening uh, for my own self even. I remember I was six years old and I had pneumonia uh, and I had to spend three weeks in the hospital. And I was hoping every single night, you know, like uh, sometimes you just imagine it's a Christmas night and you can make a wish that, gonna <laughs> that will make um some changes to your life so i imagine that every night was a christmas night and i was just hoping that one day <clears throat> i could just be home instead of and right now it seems like we have the technology finally and like 30 years later i can finally see that happening so my wish became true that is awesome. I love that vision. And especially for, you know, this whole concept of, you know, getting that postpartum care from home, from, from life to death and having it from home at the end of your life, really, really encouraging and inspirational to think that that could be something that happens very easily in the next 10, you know, 20 years that it becomes a normal, um, becomes a norm. I'd love to now move on to your personal life. You know, what are some things that you do in your personal life? You are uh, an analyst in the healthcare technology space. You're tracking trends all the time, have lots of things going on, always have to be 10 steps ahead of the curve. What are things you do to work your best and make a difference? Uh, well, definitely was a learning curve and still is for me and probably will always be, which is fine. Uh, I just learned that you have to let your brain wander at times. So when you work hard on reports or consulting work and so on, you just need to take those moments when you let your brain wander. And usually that's the time when the best results occur. Um, brain is capable of delivering answers to the questions you asked it for like weeks ago, and they just pop up in the most unexpected time. Uh, so I learned that and I often, I take some walks and I work out and I'm thinking about certain trends. And I think it creates a first, like somewhat good life work balance. And also it's definitely that, you know, like relaxed mode that I allow my brain to have. Um, also, I probably can say that I get the most out of talking to people, meeting uh, professionals, other analysts, uh, leaders in the industry. And I'm just absorbing how they think, how they phrase things, how they talk about certain things, right? Like we all know that there is a layer of marketing, but also like they always deliver some, you know, in-depth insights uh, about how they truly think and what they really want to address. And that that is usually very inspirational. Uh, I constantly see that we're all working in the same chessboard <laughs> and we're all making sure that figures move in the right direction. So those probably two main things, obviously I do a lot of stuff uh, in order to train myself to del deliver the best results. I started to learn how to enjoy the process much more than the result. So when you truly enjoy um, handpicking all the information, putting it together, talking to people and making sure that they have information that you have, just because it makes our overall work more efficient. I'm wondering, do you have any advice you would give to yourself, your younger self? You know, thinking about where you are today and the work that you're doing today, consulting with healthcare technology firms, and then also working with Chilmark, creating these reports. What would you tell yourself as a kid um, that would might be encouraging to to yourself, to your younger self? Wow, that's a good one. 
Uh, you know, I would probably tell myself that look for people who really value you. Even if you cannot find them, always know that they do exist and it's just a matter of time of meeting them. Second advice is um, always remember that you can learn, that you can evolve into anything you would like to become. And there are tons of tools around you. Again, it's just a matter of opening the right doors. And to open the right doors, you have to open 2,000 wrong doors before you find that one that's going to lead you to the right path. I love that. I love that. Now, are there any inspirational or leadership quotes that inspire you that you'd like to share with our audience? Anything that has stuck with you and, and kind of keeps you going on the day-to-day? Uh, the first one, probably always invest heavily in relations. That applies not only to my uh, professional work, it also applies to my uh, private life, to who I am besides uh, being an analyst. Uh, it, it always brings results. It, it Sometimes uh, you might not see it momentarily, but at the end, you will always have a great harvest. And also it, it keeps your energy level very high when you just know that you are very connected, you in a constant dialogue, not only with yourself, but also with other people. And that enriches you every day. And second advice is always run an extra mile. Always. Uh, even when you have a very tough and very strictly de described uh, request from the vendor or the client, always run an extra mile. Uh, it might not be useful for the vendor particularly, but it's always going to be useful for yourself. And in the moment when uh, the client is not 100% sure, you will always have this information ready. For, for them and you can share you know like with a good level of expertise on the subject I think those two are the most important and just for myself um you know like recently the world I, I just keep on noticing <laughs> looking out of my window that world is changing so quickly uh, that it's just fine to accept that some things they happen much quicker than they used to be even 10 years ago and it's fine, and we all need to adjust ourselves to accept the speed of life and speed of changes and not to beat ourselves too hard. Mm, so, so true. Now, to finish off this conversation right, where can our listeners find you online? They always can find me on chillmarkresearch.com. Uh, I do make some blog posts, um, and also you're going to find some videos with me on YouTube <clears throat> if you're going to. Google Elena Yakovleva, Chillmark Research. You're going to be taken to our channel on YouTube. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I know my last name is not the easiest, but Grace, I hope you can add a little line under this video with my information. So I am always happy to talk about hospital at home, whether you're provider, adopter, payer. Um, I take a great pride in uh, linking all those three sides of equation to bring the best results um, to the industry. So happy to talk. Also, I um, am more than willing to speak on hospital at home at any conferences. Uh, and I'm accepting all the invitations since it's early in the season. So always happy to talk about hospital at home in any shape or form. That is terrific. Now, before I forget, did you happen to bring tea with you today? Yes, I did. Oh, now tell me about your mug. It's woodland <laughs> creatures. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so it has deers, squirrels, owls, rabbits, flowers, and leaves on it. And this is actually a gift from my neighbor. Uh, as I said before, I really work hard on relations. And that's another amazing um amazing connection that I was able to establish, not only me, but her also. We became such good friends in the recent years living next to each other. Um, and I just look at this mug as a physical expression of our friendship and relations that occur with people. And I'm very thankful for this experience. 
it's such an amazing thing when we can support one another, especially our neighbors. They're right there, right, you know, to help you in need and you can help them in need and, and to help each other out. It really is a beautiful thing to build community. Very true. And Grace, you know, um, it seems like some traditions, they just faded away, right? Like before when we used to make cakes or pies and bring it to our neighbors. And now it seems like, well, it's not that appropriate. Like who would care, you know, some strange lady showing up at your door with some weird <laughs> pastry. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's just a matter of allowing yourself that, okay, maybe somebody would look at you like with those like strange eyes, not realizing what you're trying to achieve but you will always found, find those people who appreciate it to no limits mm -hmm. that is too good well thank you so much lena for joining us today it was so great to have you on the podcast grace thank you so much always a pleasure talking to you and thanks to you all too check out the hit like a girl podcast website and youtube page for more great guests like elena today cheers <laughs>